Welcome to IRG's Health Talk. I'm Tom Hutler, along with Shannon O'Kelly, physical therapist and president of Integrated Rehabilitation Group, and our guest, Dr. Stan Herring from UW Medicine Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Dr. Herring is the director of spine, sports, and musculoskeletal medicine for the UW Medicine Health System and co-medical director of the Seattle Sports Concussion Program. He's also a team physician for the Seattle Seahawks, Seattle Mariners, and a consultant to the UW Sports Medicine Program and the Seattle Store. He serves as a member of the NFL's Head, Neck, and Spine Committee. Dr. Herring, thanks for joining us today. As Tom mentioned uh, when he did the introduction, your experience is vast and you've been dealing with sports medicine and particularly concussions or head trauma. Uh, What is a concussion for those people out there that are listening? It's very important to understand that a concussion is a brain injury. And most brain injuries get better in, in terms of concussion, but they don't always get better. So they all need to be taken seriously. What usually happens in a concussion, there's a blow to the head or sometimes to the body, and the force is transmitted to the head, and it causes certain cells in the brain not to function normally. And that can present a lot of different ways. Sometimes it can be confusion. Other times it can be headache. Sometimes it can be personality change. Most concussions, if treated properly, get better. But they don't all get better, so they must all be taken seriously and evaluated fully. And we've heard so much in the media and, and, you know, almost daily in the news, you're hearing about concussions, particularly like in the NFL. It's not just, I think it's important, it's not just high contact sports that this can be a problem. I mean, it's sports in general. All sports, boys and girls, and not just sports, recreational activities as well. And again, let's talk about some symptoms because I know as a physical therapist, I mean, I've seen concussions on the field and the symptoms or the presentation of concussion can be varied. I think that's the challenge. So what are some, I guess, cardinal signs and some other minor signs that we need to be aware of? Loss of consciousness suggests concussion, but you know, that's present in less than 10% of cases. What do you see? Some athletes are confused, dazed, stunned, move slowly. Others may complain of headache, sensitivity to bright lights or noise, and even others may look different. They may be more sad. They may be giddy. And you're right. Depending on what part of the brain is involved, the symptoms are quite variable. Looking for any change in the athlete, whether they're more confused or dazed, whether they don't move as well, they seem off balance, or whether their personality has changed, are all important indicators that a concussion may have occurred. Now, so let's let's take us out on a football or a, even a, a play field, and there's so much activity going on. The coach is involved in coaching the game. The parents are watching the game. You know, an athlete sustains a blow or, 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 or you know, like a whiplash type injury or a contact type injury. Is there anything that we should be looking for that would give us a telltale sign that athlete needs to be looked at? Eyes open. Make sure that you're paying attention. So if you do see an athlete who takes a blow, not necessarily to the head, but a big blow to the body even, or their head strikes the ground. That's an opportunity for you to be vigilant. And then start looking. Are they getting up easily? Are they moving without stumbling? And when they come to the sideline, do they seem confused, slow, disoriented? Are they complaining of a headache, nausea, bright lights or loud noises bother them? It's our responsibility as coaches and parents to make sure that we have a high index of suspicion for any youth athlete who may have been concussed. So what you're saying is, just so we can clarify kind of the cause and mechanics, I mean, a lot of people would assume that you have to have a blow, particularly to the head area, to sustain a concussion. But what I hear you saying and talking about is a whiplash type or a torsion type injury of the neck can cause a concussion also. Most concussions occur when there's a blow to the head, but they don't all occur that way. The whiplash mechanism you've talked about, a big blow to the body and the head then strikes the ground. Anything that uh, can transmit force to the brain. And from a physiological, mechanical standpoint, when we look at the brain, people need to understand the brain. Talk about the brain anatomically. I mean, it's in this space enclosed by the skull, and that's problematic for trauma. Right. It's, it's, um, the brain is inside the skull, and there's a little room for the brain to move inside the skull. And it may be the motion of the brain against the skull or rotation forces that cause shearing of the brain tissue. So while there's no helmet or external device that can prevent concussion, it seems that makes sense because the, the problem is the relationship between the skull and the brain, not the skull and the outside world. In your experience, is there any way to um, 
ascertain like is this is there such thing as a minor moderate and major concussion i'm fond of saying if you've seen one concussion you've seen one concussion they're all different and sometimes concussions are different within the same athlete from concussion to concussion we do not grade concussions anymore grading them one two or three we really don't know how significant a concussion will be until we see the full picture so we grade them on duration severity and number of symptoms so it may take a day or two to even understand how significant that concussion might be now remember the great majority of concussions get better in one to two weeks but they don't all get better and you don't know how bad it is until you know how bad it is so we're careful not to call them grade one two or three we look at each concussion and see how it affects that individual you must understand that each person's reaction to a concussion is very unique hence that's why it's so difficult to you know quote i use the word treatment if there is any treatment because every individual is different every presentation like you said is unique and different every person's concussion experience is different now there are guidelines and parameters we can use and watch but you must look at these as individual events you know going back maybe 10 years ago or so in sports I remember parents coming to me and saying, well, you know, my daughter came or my son came home from an activity and the coach said, well, they bumped their head. They might have, you know, keep an eye on them. And the old adage was, oh, you keep them awake and watch them and wake them up two or three times a night. I don't know if you remember those days, but I kind of remember those days. A lot's changed since then. And I talk about how many, it, these, what to do if your child comes home from an event, you weren't at the event and they're complaining about a headache. What's the, what, what's the action plan? If a child has symptoms you think may be concussion, then it's important to monitor them and see how they do. Once a concussion occurs, the symptoms should not get worse, and new symptoms should not develop. So if you have a child who becomes increasingly sleepy or increasingly irritable, or you notice that one side of their body does not move like the other, or they have vomiting two or three times, if there's any suggestion of deterioration, that's a reason to go to the emergency room. You call 911. It's uncommon, but not unheard of. Otherwise, rest, activities is tolerated, no physical activity. And if you're worried enough that you think you have to wake up your son or daughter every two hours, take them to the emergency room. Again, these are great points, and I have so many questions. And one of the things that just popped in my mind is people need to understand also concussions can be cumulative. I mean, repetitive concussions aren't good. And we talk about this second impact syndrome. Tell us about that and why it's so important to notice that. There are unique things in young athletes that really raise concern. Now, they're rare. Once again, most young athletes who become concussed or get concussed get better. But there are certain things that are unique to young athletes. Having a second concussion while still having symptoms from a first concussion can rarely but tragically result in severe injury or death. And the brain seems to swell uncontrollably. This is a youth and teen, a, a young athlete and a teenage athlete issue. So absolutely, if there's any suggestion of a concussion, the athlete, the young athlete needs to be removed and made sure they're symptom free before there's any chance of suffering a second blow. More commonly, besides the tragic consequences, if you take a young athlete and they're concussed and you concuss her again, you may turn a two-week injury into a two-month injury. Now, remember, there's a word that comes before athlete in this group. It's student. So you not affect only sports, but you're talking schoolwork and homework and social development and driver's education and everything else that goes along with being a young person. And as a result of um, a second impact situation, you were very instrumental and involved in what in the state of Washington is called the Zach Lystead Law. And maybe explain that a little bit and kind of take us back what happened, the scenario, and how that came to be. Zach Lystead was a 13-year-old football player, and he uh, was involved in a tackle and was seen on the field holding his head with a significant headache. He was taken out, halftime came, but he was put back in the third quarter, and Zach still had symptoms. And he continued to play, and those symptoms escalated. Zach's particular in- injury was a little different than his second impact syndrome, but the idea is similar. Because he continued to play with symptoms, ongoing brain damage occurred. And because of the good fortune of Harborview Medical Center, Zach's life was saved. But the consequence to Zach and his family 
was that he is going to face a lifelong struggle with significant challenges. Now, he's a heroic young man. But the story here is if Zach would have been taken out when he was first concussed, this would not have happened. This is a preventable injury. That led us to push an educational effort, but then we realized that education alone wasn't enough, and that started the first legislative effort of its type in the country, passing the Zachary Lastet Law in 2009. And that law is very clear guidelines regarding concussion and return to play and who can clear. And maybe if you can, just give us an outline of that law. Sure. The law is pretty simple. Education is a critical component. Parents and athletes or their guardians need to be educated about concussion. There needs to be a way to educate coaches about concussion. And then if there's any suspicion of a concussion, the athlete is removed from practice or play at that time. And the third piece that athlete is not cleared to return to play until he or she has seen a licensed health care provider knowledgeable about the management of concussion who then follows them and clears them in writing to return to practice and play. And is there any length that that athlete has to sit out based on the law? I mean, I used to hear seven days, but as long as they're clear, what's going on there? We like to say that you never manage a concussion by a calendar. Each athlete is individual, so that goes to the skill and experience of the licensed health care provider to make sure that that individual athlete has met all criteria for return to practice and play. There is no set time period. Some kids, it may be a week. Some kids, it may be a month or longer. Yeah, this concussion is, is uh, you know, is very complicated. And as we wrap this up, do you have any kind of number? I mean, I have a lot of parents come to me before and say, hey, my son has two concussions. I mean, and the doc says if he has a third one, he's out of contact sports. What about any parameters there? You know, the, this idea of trying to put a number to this, I think, is limited. It's better to say this. Concussion management really goes not only to the number, but the, to duration, severity, and proximity. How many, how bad, how close together, And what is that individual's makeup? Yes, there may be some athletes who suffer three concussions and it's career-ending, but that's not a hard and fast number. This really goes to the skill and experience of the health care provider who is working with you to manage concussion and your young athlete. Okay, well, talking to a man with a lot of information, where would I go to to get more information on this? The Zach Leistead Law and Concussion Treatment. There's great information sources. The Center for Disease Control concussion website is spectacular. NFL Evolution, part of the NFL website, has all the information about the Zach Leistat Law. Or check out um, our Seattle Sports Concussion Program at uh, uwmedicine.org slash sportsconcussion, and we have links to every program that I've discussed with you. Dr. Herring, thank you for your time. Great information. Thank you. If you would like more information on this topic, as well as how to contact Dr. Stan Herring, go to uwmedicine.org, irgpt.com, click on the Health Media tab, or go to Integrated Rehabilitation Group's Facebook page.